I'm going to say something that might horrify you, but I ask you guys for the courtesy to just give me a few minutes to explain myself. I've come to believe that in order to feed the poor, we actually have to improve the way we feed the wealthy. We live in a culture that tremendously glorifies innovation. And that's important because innovation is what led to so much of the progress that most of us enjoy today. But I think we can also all agree that there are certain types of innovation that aren't just not adding value, but that in the process of producing these innovations, we actually incur more cost and produce more waste. And I'll give you a simple example, water. Most of you guys, if you go to your grocery stores, you're going to find like 97,000 different types of bottles of water to pick from. <laughs> Whether it's vitamin water, caffeinated water, protein water, mineral water, sparkling water, sparkling water that's slightly flavored, uh, and my favorite, gluten-free water. <laughs> and, and I think we can all appreciate that we don't really need to complicate our relationship with water this much. Um, not only that, what is most upsetting about this isn't that this incremental innovation is marketed as a tremendous breakthrough that is worthy of the incredible cost that is asked of the consumer to be paid. What's disturbing is that it literally takes more water to make the plastic bottle than the water inside it. And that's pretty depressing when you consider that we desperately need water and actually we desperately don't need plastic. By 2050, we're expecting to, to, to live in a world where we might have more plastic in the ocean than fish. So when you think of these things, and you took a look at what I do now for a living, I'm in a similar situation when I look at protein in Western countries. If you walk into a grocery store, almost everything now is fortified with protein. Literally, candy has protein in it. And you would be tempted to conclude one of two things. Either North Americans, Americans in particular, are so deficient in protein that we need to literally fortify our candy with it, <laughs> or that we are just living in a world with such an abundant amount of protein that we literally just don't know what to do with it. And on both counts, you would be gravely mistaken. The average American only needs to consume about 60 grams of protein a day. Do you know how much the average American consumes? <laughs> Nearly double that. And on the point of perhaps we just produce an excess of protein, that is actually the furthest thing from the truth, and I'm going to spend a good chunk of the few minutes I have up here explaining why that's the case. But before I get into that, let me pose a paradox. If we all just agreed that we don't really need more innovations for the sake of innovating, and we don't really need more protein in our lives, why am I trying to get Americans to eat protein-packed crickets? <laughs> to appreciate why that's the case and why it's not a, a contradiction in terms, why I believe insects have the potential to transform global, global food security, you need to actually understand why I started this company in the first place. I grew up wanting to be a doctor, uh, like many people in the room. You know, I grew up to Egyptian parents, so I could be anything in the world as long as it's doctor or engineer. <laughs> I need to give them way more credit than that. They also allow me the option of lawyer. Um, <laughs> uh, so so I, I, I grew up wanting to be a physician because I always, always enjoyed serving others. It came naturally to me, as corny as that sounds, it literally was its own reward. And I also developed a fascination with the human body and, and, and with uh, science. And my curiosity is what led me to realize that medicine is most likely the inevitable choice. I applied to medical twice, school twice, and got rejected both times, not even a single interview. And so I went and went back to school and, and tried a third time. And this time I got that email that I thought was going to change my life, that admission letter that said, congratulations, you've been admitted. What I didn't realize was going to happen is that two months later, another email, completely unrelated to my medical career, would actually be the one that changes my life. And it was a simple invitation to participate in a competition called the Holt Prize, which is the largest business prize in the world. It's a $1 million prize that encourages and inspires students and to become entrepreneurs who solve some of the biggest ch challenges in the world. And in 2013, that challenge was food security. Can you build a business that can profitably 
achieve food security for 20 million people in less than 10 years. So I put together a team from my, my school and we started to really look into this issue and study it very closely. And one of the things that blew our minds was that there's actually a source of protein that millions of people around the world in the vast majority of the world's countries already consume precisely because it's considered delicious and nutritious. And it's insects. At the time, that was a pretty ludicrous thing to say. Nowadays, I think most people in this audience have come to appreciate in one way or another that this is actually a thing. And at the time, what we realized, which blew us, blew our minds away, was that in most of these countries where insects are consumed, the challenge isn't actually demand, you know, getting people to want to eat insects. It's actually the opposite. There is so much demand that there isn't the adequate supply to serve that demand. And that's because in most countries where insects are consumed, they're only available seasonally for a few months in the year, which means that people literally have to go out in the wild and hand harvest them. And that's also for only a few months in the year. So we figured, what if we can come up with a way to farm these insects year-round? And if, what if we could compartmentalize and package this technology in such a way where we can actually empower people in rural communities to produce these insects to feed not only themselves, but to feed their communities and rise out of poverty. This idea and this business model ultimately led us to defeat over 10,000 teams from around the world to win the million dollar Hull Prize. And this was a transformative experience for myself and my co-founders, and obviously a great way to validate our business model. But every entrepreneur will tell you that you have to get into the habit every now and then of questioning the fundamental assumptions that led you to start your business, because if the assumptions underpinning all of your strategy are wrong, then your strategy itself is gonna be wrong. And so we started to really do a deeper dive into this problem, and we began to realize that we cannot look at food security, meaning making sure that people who don't have, people have access to safe, affordable, and nutritious food, making sure that that problem is not isolated from a far bigger problem happening globally, and it's the issue of food sustainability. And I just want to paint that picture to everybody here for a second, and I'm sure most people are aware of these statistics at some level. In order to feed 7.5 billion people today, we are using approximately 80% of all of the fresh water supply on Earth. On top of that, 80% of the farmable land that we use we use not to grow crops that we eat, but instead we use it to grow crops which we feed to animals that we eat. Mm -hmm. Livestock production contributes more to greenhouse gas emissions than the entire transportation sector combined. And we have taken some of the most extraordinarily rich and biodiverse land on Earth, think of the Amazon, and deforested nearly 91% of it just so we can create room to farm crops which we feed to animals which we eat. When you look at this picture, you begin to appreciate that we're facing a serious crisis when it comes to food production globally. And that's, in and of itself, anxiety inducing. But when you realize that over the course of the next 25 years, it's estimated that we're going to have to double our food production to feed an additional 2, 2 billion people, then it starts to get really concerning. And the reason for that isn't just that we're going to see a population increase, which we expect to happen, but that the people on Earth today are actually eating more meat. Last year was a record-breaking year for the amount of meat Americans have consumed through history. And even countries that we don't typically associate with meat, like India, actually are increasingly consuming a lot of meat. In fact, 80% of the population of India consumes meat, contrary to what most of us might think instinctively. And so, why is that the case? The reason that's the case is because we have chosen to obtain most of our protein from animals that are just extremely inefficient at converting what they eat into protein. A simple math can illustrate this. It takes a cow about 20 pounds of feed just to give you a single pound of beef. And so if you look at that equation, you begin to appreciate that all of the amount of land, water, energy, pesticide, herbicide, emissions, 
involved in the production of that massive amount of crops, 20 times the protein you get at the output, you begin to understand why this equation is extremely inefficient and imbalanced. And so we have to look at this very carefully and ask ourselves, is there a way we could transform our food system and allow this planet to continue to scale and grow without having to colonize Mars to do so? I want to give you guys a metaphor, an example that could also paint this picture a little bit differently. Imagine that we have a double-decker ship. On the top level, of course, are the more affluent passengers who have their luxury cabins with their own fireplaces. And on the bottom deck, of course, are the bunk beds and those who are far less fortunate than where they reside. In the top bunk of this boat, there's a room that contains all of the wood that should be necessary for all of the passengers in their luxury suites to use that wood to heat up their fireplaces at night. Unfortunately, everybody in the top deck of this boat starts heating their rooms constantly around the clock. And although there was initially enough supply of wood on the boat to service the need of the passengers, it ran out very quickly. And so a few passengers on the top deck very cleverly thought, why don't we just go downstairs in the lower bunk and just pull out a plank of wood and break it up and put it into our fireplace? I mean, surely one plank is not going to sink the ship. But the problem is, when enough people start to do that, the entire ship sinks. And the worst part is the first people who suffer are the ones who had nothing to do with this in the first place. And so we started to begin to appreciate a very uncomfortable reality which is if we want to be authentic to the mission that got us to start this business in the first place, that got us to win this million dollar prize, which is to ensure long-term food insecurity for the poor, we have to devote ourselves to transforming the way those of us who are more affluent eat. Because it's our food practices, it's our consumption patterns that are the ones that are placing the most tremendous stress on our planet. And they're the ones that are going to have the ramifications on the rest of our co-inhabitants in this world. And so that led us to start thinking, what is, gee, do we know of a, a source of food that could solve this problem? And of course, we look back at the drawing board and realize that it stared us right in the face. It was the same source of food we had spent years trying to make more available and more affordable to those who already eat it. And it was insects like crickets. And so we thought of how do we make this possible and what does the world need in order for us to feed 9.5 billion people? Well, for, for start, whatever food we, we eat and produce, it has to be efficient and it has to be resilient and it has to be something we can produce at scale. Because if we can't do those things, then it's not going to work. And so that's one criteria. What's another criteria? It has to be a source of food that is weather resistant, that is pesticide resistant, that you can store and produce virtually anywhere on the planet. And when we put together this, this wish list of what this ideal crop has to look like, it was unavoidable to escape the conclusion that insects may be the most ideal crop in existence in terms of delivering a very dense amount of nutrition, particularly protein, for a fraction of the environmental cost because they use an incredibly limited amount of land, water, and energy to produce. And so we turn to vertical indoor agriculture. You see here a picture of our farm in Austin, Texas. This is a prototype farm that is a model for many commercial farms that we intend to set up around the world. And what we are relying on is the fact that you can produce protein in a very dense way indoors, meaning you don't have to worry about dramatic weather conditions that could destroy your crop. You don't have to worry about pests or intruders. You don't have to worry about changes in the topology or the topography in, in, in our climate. And most importantly, you can literally set this up virtually anywhere in the world and achieve the same yield every single time and in a humane way because we happen to work with an organism that not only thrives in conditions of, of crowding and, de and density, but also thrives in nocturnal conditions at night. Well, that's great, but 
will Americans actually eat crickets? Because you can have an amazing innovation that works that changes the world, but if people aren't willing to buy into it, it's not really going to be a success, is it? And so we realized here that if we want this to work, we cannot appeal to people's guilty conscience. We have to appeal to their taste buds. Food is an intensely emotional experience. Most of us will not eat something that doesn't make us feel good just because we know it makes the planet a better place. We'd rather drive an electric car, but still go for that, you know, that meal that just makes us feel fantastic. So that's why we focused on how do we transform insects into incredible functional ingredients that we can use in everyday foods and snacks and beverages and center of plate meats. And we take examples from other areas in our own history. In the 1800s, many of you may not know this, but lobsters were considered the garbage food of society in the eastern part of the United States, particularly in Maine. They were considered, they were considered a bottom feeder and a cockroach of the sea that used to wash up on the shores 20 and 30 feet high. In fact, the only people in society that were fed lobsters were actually prisoners and indentured servants. And even they found lobsters to be too much. To the extent that indentured servants, I'm not making this up, literally lobbied and successfully were able to negotiate a clause in their contract that says that it is considered cruel and unusual to feed them lobster more than three times a week. And we now all know where lobsters are in our society from a culinary standpoint. An even closer example is sushi. About two decades ago, if I came to the average American and I said, what do you think of eating raw fish? They would give you a pretty weird and slightly disgusted look. And now most of us can't go by a week without craving this as our lunch. So in my mind, in the mind of everybody in this industry, this is an inevitability. We've, we've proven time and time again that we can embrace new foods and new cultures and new traditions, but we just require the most ideal format in which to consume it and enjoy it. When I think back to you know five and a half years ago, when I stood in you know uh, theater with about 200 of my classmates taking the Hippocratic Oath, ready to become uh, and embrace the, the journey to become a physician, I remember at that point thinking that the whole point of this oath is to make a commitment to heal people with a degree of dignity and service, and although I've long since taken off that coat, and I've dropped out of medical school to start my cricket farm, something my Egyptian parents are super proud of. <laughs> I am convinced that what I am doing, and what many people around the world attempting to do the same thing are doing, has the, 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 the potential to transform not thousands of lives, but hundreds of millions of lives around the world. And not only that, but we will do it long before people get sick. One of the things that depressed me the most about medicine and what I specifically wanted to be a nurse surgeon was the realization that by the time a patient would need to see me, so much has gone wrong upstream of that meeting that really the point of my intervention is going to be damage control. It's not going to be to prevent or set them on a course that could transform their lives in a very positive way. What we are trying to do is we're trying to intervene long before people have the very significant setbacks that make it virtually impossible to transform their lives. And that's, I think, one of the most faithful ways to remain committed to the Hippocratic Oath. Thank you very much. <laughs>